welcome back Chargeheads. So in this episode, we're gonna be visiting a chap called Paul Compton. He is pretty much an EV conversion guru. He's been doing it since the mid 90s, uh, was famous uh, for his Volkswagen Scirocco, uh, which was capable of over 100 miles an hour uh, using a DC motor and um, lead acid batteries. Um, and in the mid 90s, he did a Hillman Impa State uh, running on NICAD batteries, you know, the old ones you used to get in the camcorders. Um, also, he did a Reliant Kitten, which had a bit like a Robin Reliant, only a bit safe because I had four wheels. Um, that had golf cart batteries in it at a range of about 25, 30 miles. Again, amazing back in those days. Then from 96 to 99, he actually ended up going to America um, to help a race team um, race a 914 Porsche. And yeah, had lots of fun doing that, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, he's, he's a wealth of knowledge uh, from a historical electric point of view and in engineering of that type. Um, he was on Scrappy Challenge uh, in 2005. We have expert Paul Compton, who specialises in converting road cars into electric cars. So he's got so many projects, it's unbelievable. And I mean, I did record a lot of them, but I've narrowed it down because there was loads, I'm telling you, loads, including bike ones. He's a massive bike man as well. Um, currently on the go, he's got, he's re, he bought back his Scirocco, so he's redoing that. Um, as you'll see, it uh, needs a lot of work. This is uh, where we start with the Lotus Esprit. I hope you enjoy. Such a beautiful shape, Carl. Yeah, I, I much prefer the Chijaro styled Esprits to the later ones. What uh, What is the plan? Are you going to electrify this then? Well, that may be eventually. Yeah. Um, this is what I wanted to do in the first place. Is ever since doing the racing in the 90s. Yeah. Um, not driving, just development. I've always wanted to do an electric Esprit, but Esprit Pisces had gone through the roof yeah. in recent years, um, and I ended up buying the Excel, which is still a very affordable car and is something of a, um, a forgotten Lotus. Absolutely. And um, it's, it's all your fault that, uh, that I'm now into these Lotus XLs. As soon as you said, Brit you know, as soon as you said Lotus, so British classic, and Toyota, aka Japanese parts, you had me sold straight away. So, but yeah, no, thank you for showing it's us awesome. this. This is the uh, to the, the ride to the shops. It's the powered shopping cart. Yeah. Um, <laughs> second G with the front. First one was a bit rough. Yeah. I then bought a really clean DC one. Uh, the DC cars are really gutless. You see this curb here that I have to bump up. Yeah. If you rolled up to that curb in a DC car and then tried to climb it, you might not. The AC car will climb it. I, do you know what? T until the, literally this second, I didn't realise there was a DC and an AC version. So yeah, yeah. The the changeover is about um, 2007 when they the way brought the AC cars in. Ah. And there was a uh, lithium powered one which also had disc brakes on the front. Ah, because I thought that the lithium powered ones were ones that people had actually. No, you no, know. There, were, there were factory ones, but oh, most wow. people convert. The old, the old ones. Safe, but it sounds like you're going to let me have a little spin yeah, yeah. in the G-Wiz. Um, That'd be awesome. This one with, you'll notice it's sitting very high on the suspension. Yeah, she's, she's not slammed like the Lotus, is she? Well, these sit fairly <laughs> high in the first place because they're made for Indian roads. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. They were made in, designed in America, made in India. Right. And I think they actually jacked them up a bit for the Indian rough roads. Right. Now this has only got 14 Gen 1 leaf modules in it. Right. And it's so light, the suspension's nearly topped out. <laughs> but it does make it a bit more sprightly. Let's go inside, let's go and find the other but projects. The thing with and the uh... is, is when it comes to fit and finish, nothing really fits and nothing's finished. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Right, let's, let's go a bit further into the uh... treasure trove. That's the early leaf inverter. Yeah. Which doesn't bolt to the motor, it has a short connecting cable. Yep. That's the one they used from 2013 onwards, which <coughs> has the, um, well, that, those are the bus bars coming down, and then there are bus bars underneath which go down into the motor. Yep. Uh, Gen 3 is then the same. This is like 2018 on. Um, this is the version that there is a 
uh, 160 kilowatt yes. version of. So this is the one that all the uh, the leaf uh, tuners are uh, hoping to put well, on there. The thing is, there's no difference in the power stage between the 110 and the 160. Right. It's internal firmware. Okay. So but nobody is... yet has a way of putting the high power firmware on. You have to pull the logic board out and put the open source logic board in. Yes. What, what's this motor? This is a... That's the rear motor from a uh, Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV, the plug-in hybrid. Right, okay. And it's linked up to the guts of a Toyota Prius inverter. Yep. And this bit of breadboard um, is um, the open source um, inverter software but I'm not running any one circuit board it's all just done on, on breadboard at the moment but I have spun the motor with that and uh, a lot of people use this particular motor for the mini you said uh, well, it's a convenient one because it comes with a transaction and drive shafts it's like organised chaos in here it's just like my uh... no it is not organised <laughs> it's <laughs> just, just chaos, chaos. <laughs> But you know, there's there's some leaf cells under the yeah, bench, yeah, see, which see, is my that, yeah. um, uh, my test pack, and there's. So how many? Uh, what's the? Uh... That's a forty-eight volt. Right. Um, which is enough for running the motor up. A couple of charges there. Yeah. So here we have the the legendary Scirocco. Um. On a, on a rotisserie, she, she's looking like, uh, yeah, she, hard at work because I think you've, you've got a few uh, body repairs uh, to do on the vehicle. Uh, yeah, but... She's in pretty sound condition, yeah, um, but you know, there is rust of a minor level in a lot of places, yeah, um, that needs to be sorted out. And uh, is it true that this was the first? EV conversion in the UK to go over 100 miles an hour? I think it, in, in, uh, it's quite likely that it was, yeah. Um, there weren't many electric vehicles around in the UK that would go quickly at all. Uh, certainly not as road legal vehicles. And uh, you, uh, you pulled me up because one of my uh, videos for charge heads was the first EV track day. We're in Landau for the EV only track day. As you can see, there's some amazing electric cars here today. It wasn't the first EV track day, was it? No, the, um, one of the Battery Vehicle Society members mm -hmm. lived on Anglesey or had a house on Anglesey. And they knew the owner of the Anglesey racetrack. Yeah. And on this particular occasion, it was the Eisteddfod weekend. Right. And they weren't able to operate the circuit. Okay. Because of the noise. Uh, right. So the Battery Vehicle Society had free use of the circuit, but not a huge number of vehicles went up. But the Sirocco went up. Um, our, the then treasurer had a Fiat One Two Six. Nice. Which I quite a popular break... conversion at the moment, isn't it? The One Two Six. It is now. It was. I mean, it was done with. Nothing was a popular conversion back then, Paul. No, <laughs> it was done with the motor from a pedestrian-controlled vehicle. Right. Okay. It's a platform truck with a. Uh, tiller to pull it along that controlled the speed right um, um, and it was running 36 volt yeah so I went down and upgraded it to 72 volt nice and see so it's again e the EV crowd helping each other out you know yeah. and Cedric brought his legendary utterly legendary streamlined feet forward enclosed motorcycle along yep It was, of course, Angle C and threw rain down horizontally. Oh dear. Um, so there was standing water at School Bend. Right. Um, and I was running Michelin Energy tyres at 50 psi. Okay, so not yeah. exactly high grip no, uh, combination. No. And what, and what both, year was this? This is two. I think it was 2003. 2003, okay. But I was giving demonstration rides, I was carrying passengers. Wow. And I got timed at 1 minute 17 for a lap of the old layout. Yeah. And, you know, fifth gear were using it as their test track. And they were getting, Tiffany Dell was getting a hop hatch round in just under a minute. Oh. And I bet he changed gear. 
I'm pretty sure he probably did. And I did. drove the whole circuit in third gear. <laughs> awesome. Right, uh, yeah, could you give it a little spin? It'd be nice to see what it's uh, like around the whole of the body. So, originally this had, in fact, I know for sure you've got your the original motor. Here it is, it, down this here. This is the motor, um, big DC series motor, made by General Electric, four electric vehicle conversions in the 80s, because there were various government funded programs in America. If only they did a government funded uh, EV conversion thing at the moment in this country, that would, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, um, but it's going to stay DC. Yeah. Um, you know, the reason for buying this back was it was one of the best EVs that anyone had done up you, to that point. Because you bought this car, was it in 1989 you actually bought the car, but you didn't convert it until 19... 19- no, I bought it in I probably 98, 99. Yep. I bought it, I had it on the road in about 2001. Right. Um, I once had it down at the Brooklands Museum. Right, okay. Um, they had an alternative energy day down there. It got trailered down. And um, I found a bloke more or less crawling underneath it after I'd been away for a little break. And it turned out he worked at Wolfsburg. And he'd been involved with the City Strommer. The uh, factory electric Golf yeah. Mark One, is it? Uh, they went, I think they did City Strommers Mark One, Mark Two. I know they did a Mark Five. I don't know if they oh, did wow. threes and fours. Um, but he couldn't understand how this existed because it's a Carmen built car, not a Volkswagen built car, never been anywhere near Wolfsburg. So he wanted to know how there was a city strom of Sirocco. Yes. And was quite impressed to discover that it was a home built because he said it was actually better quality installation than the Mark 1 city strommer. Well, that's... But uh... I put a lot of effort into making it as, as good as it yeah. It could be, and looking like a sort of factory mule hmm. development project rather than a travelling science project, as so many <laughs> were back then. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm sure it looks a slightly different to it did back then, but you know, in terms of battery power, what was the original battery power you had on the? The original batteries in it were Optima Blue Tops, which was the marine variant of the Optima Deep Cycle. They did a red top starter battery. Yeah. Um, they did a yellow top deep cycle. And they did the blue top, which was the same thing with an additional pair of terminals, which was a nice point to connect my battery monitoring system to. Yeah. Um, and the original batteries came via John Wayland of White Zombie. Ah, car frame. the White Zombie. Showtime. <laughs> And I sold it in 2005. And wh- what year did you buy it back? Uh, 2018, 19. Okay. I can't remember exactly when now. And you, um, from, well, from uh, knowing that it had quite a lot of water damage, hence why you're, you know, repairing it again. What, we were speaking about batteries. You're keeping the original motor, the I'm keeping DC the original one DC down there. motor and controller because that's the way I built it. Yeah. It was a quick car. You know, it would out accelerate, certainly not to 40, it would out accelerate the 1.0 GTI. Nice. Um, no problem with top top speed. No, you know, my over, commute was down the motorway. Yeah, over 100 miles an hour. Certainly capable of that. Yeah. I did. I did chicken out of going over the 100 miles an hour um, to make sure that I didn't lose my license. Very important. Um, but, you know, originally it ran 16, 20 kilo Optimus, yeah. eight in the front, eight in the back. Now the plan is BMW 330e plug-in hybrid. Yeah. Um, a pack from one of those is 12 kilowatt hours, six modules, 12 and a half kilos each. And I can lose one of those in each front and rear battery box. Yeah. Um, in fact, you've got them over in the corner over there, there I think. There, there are some on the shelf over there. And actually, yeah. I'll show you my battery boxes. So here we have the battery boxes. Okay. So each one of these supported eight wow. 20 kilo battery batteries. Um, they're 22 gauge steel. Can I... Uh, very, very light. Let me... Okay, yeah. They certainly feel robust, but yeah, like you say, they are fairly light as well, which is uh, important. 
but to follow the progress of this car uh, and it will be also the uh, progress of the Lotus XL and many other projects which Paul uh, no doubt will be uh, uh, taking on. Uh, check out his YouTube channel which is Paul Compton on YouTube or go to his website paulcompton.co.uk, is that correct? Yeah, that goes straight to the YouTube channel. Beautiful. So, here is project number, I think I've lost count. This is the most recent project. Um, kind of. It's the re most recent one. Well, I suppose the, the Esprit is the most recent. No, yeah, that's a good point, actually, yeah. So this is nearly the most recent project. Yes. And, uh, yeah, as I was saying earlier, uh, Paul got me into the XL, which is what you see before you, um, when we started chatting at the Late Break Show Live, uh, the Johnny Smith Show. The, the Leicestershire one. That's right, yes. And um, I found, well, now I've done a little bit of research on these things. This, this is a, a wide body version, or not an SE. So it's the 160 brake horsepower instead of the 180 brake yeah. horsepower. Um, and uh, I mean, what, what made you want to EV convert this car? Um, well, I'd always wanted to do it Lotus of Spring. Yep. Spree prices were too expensive. Um, and then I thought, what about the Forgotten Lotus? What about the Excel? Yeah. Um, now these were a um, 50-50 weight distribution. They were reportedly quicker around the Hethel test track than the non-turbo Esprit. Hmm. Um, that not having corners that are particularly about acceleration out of a slow corner where the mid-engine car would be superior. They are, of course, a four-seater rather than, albeit more of a two plus two than a full four seater, but the, yep. the rear is certainly generous from a leg room point yeah, of view. Yeah. As you see this car now, we were really lucky because we were able to drive it. Well, not drive it, but we were able to sit in it. The seats in the back are really comfy, but I don't think you'll be able to fit a car seat in there a lot because they've got massive dip up like that. Yeah, I've there. And I've sat in the back of one with my seat in my driving position, and the only thing was probably my head was touching the top, but it wasn't too bad. No. But sorry, you carry on. Um, and they are quite light. I'm actually weighed. You can see my my set of scales over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, with no coolant, no fuel, one thousand and eighty kilos. Which is not hugely light, but it also is not a small car. No. It's very light for a car of this size. Uh, the engine's 160 kilos, um, and that stack of MG batteries I showed you earlier is about 220. Yeah. This is a, a slant, slant four, uh, four pot? It's a slant four to get the bonnet line lower. Yeah. But it also meant they could have, in theory, done a V8 version um, but because of the the era when it was conceived was the fuel crisis they only ever actually built I think three prototype V8 engines uh, one of which found its way into the Lotus Etna concept car sort of executive another executive saloon yeah that was a 4.4 litre but the, the Esprit chassis was always capable of taking a, a V8 and people of course have put V8s in the Excel. So possibly it's nicer if you put a Lexus engine in than the Rover. Yes, when I visited Lotus Bits to go and have a look at one recently, um, that was a conversion that is supposed to be quite a popular conversion, isn't it? To have the, uh, the Lexus engine well, they're legendarily reliable, unlike the Rover. Now, now. <laughs> uh. It also fits on Toyota gearboxes. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, Lexus is Toyota. Indeed. And do you know where the uh, Lexus name came from? No. Uh, Lexus stands for Luxury US. Because the, uh, the Americans didn't like the Toyota brand for uh, the reason of uh, certain 
Harbour of Pearl. And um, yeah, so uh, they came up with a different name. Uh, well, if you're after that kind of automotive uh, trivia, <laughs> how about... It's the only one I know. <laughs> how about a nice bit of um, humour on part of the Japanese? Uh, you're not going to talk about the Mitsubishi Starion, are you? No, I'm going to talk about the Suzuki Hayabusa. Okay, so the... Right, go on then. What is a Hayabusa? Hayabusa. Sounds like high boost. It is the Japanese Peregrine Falcon. Oh, really? Ah. Is a Hayabusa. Right. What is one of the main food sources for the peregrine, Japanese Peregrine Falcon? It's going to have to be something to do with Honda, Toyota, or it won't be Daihatsu because that's not even important for most Blackbirds. people. Okay. What was the world's fastest, most powerful motorcycle before the Hayabusa? The Honda Blackbird. See, I would know that if I knew anything about motorbikes, Paul, but you know my motorbike knowledge is pretty poor but no thank I you for that <laughs> that's true <laughs> Trice, e, e tricycles uh, are going to be my new thing though as i'm sure i've told you but so so yeah so it was the lightness it was the fact that um you wanted to do a lotus esprit uh, and you found a more cost effective uh car to do which is uh, well very similar in terms of the uh the aesthetics and I, I suppose also the, seem to have a thing for 80s wedges. Uh, I too. Well, well, I don't know if you've uh, got a thing about TVR uh, Tasmins, but uh, as I'm sure you know that I do. Um, and that's probably another reason why I like the, the look of the, you know, the Lotus uh, XL. And the, the back is, uh, is a bit of a Marmite uh, design. But, I think it's an improvement over the Eclat, but... Yeah. Yeah, and I found out that the SE has a slightly different rear spoiler, and there's a few little bits on the SE bumper-wise, and other than the engine, and a few bits underneath, but essentially they are the same car. Yeah, they, ma they made a fair few little detailed changes between 82 and 92. But there's a fair old space. I mean, um, there's a decent space, and you look at the transmission tunnel down there. I'm going to just drop it down like so. It's a hell of a space. Well, remember that the chassis does take up some of that space, which is behind you. It is true. Ah, oh, that's uh, chassis. So this was something that was important to you because uh, the fact that they're galvanised from factory uh, gives you some faith that on a classic car from the 80s, early 80s, it's going to be uh, robust enough to do. Yeah, the, the elite chassis could rot out, particularly on this rear bridge, where there was basically foam rubber between this surface and the body shell. Yeah. Um, this car stood in a front garden, the last tax disc being 2006. Okay. And has suffered more than you might expect, but it's still, still sound. Yeah. And they are really quite light. Yeah. No, very much so. Amazon. But yeah, no, tell, tell us a bit more about the planned conversion. Uh, so at the moment you are refurbishing the chassis um, and you are, uh, you've are you taken obviously the engine gearbox out and the gearbox is the same as a Toyota Celica Supra gearbox, yeah, is that it's, right? It's a w... W58 gearbox. W58. So I mean you could, I mean some people could just put a motor on that gearbox, something like a net gain hyper nine but you're doing it a slightly different way T tell us all what how, how are you going to do it Paul? well what i want to be able to do is to put the motor entirely in the transmission tunnel right um so the plan is to take the first pair of gears out of the leaf gearbox build a casing that bolts to the back of the leaf motor which will then drive the original prop shaft so that will get the motor well back into the transmission tunnel. Yeah. The engine bay will then be completely available for batteries, nice. inverters, chargers, and yep. all the other components. I will probably put some of the batteries where the fuel tank used to be just for weight distribution, yeah. just to keep it balanced at 50-50. And it was 50-50 from factory as well, this car? Very close to 50-50. And that's what you're aiming for for once it's complete it's a lotus it's about handling yeah you know lotuses aren't necessarily fast cars no but the the, the old joke they used to make about the lotus alan when it was the only car 
that you could drive from A to B at an average of 65 miles an hour without ever exceeding 70. <laughs> well, you know, we're all uh, obeyers of the law here, Paul. So, uh... um, and uh, I'll actually hopefully end up with more boot space than original. Yeah, I mean, when I had a little look, uh, the boot space is, uh, is uh, yeah, pretty good. Oh, wow, so that's the fuel tank. That's the original fuel tank. Um, so how many, uh, how much battery power do you think you can put in the space where that came from? Looking at the weights, I'm thinking six modules. Okay. In in the back. That's one of these MG modules. The the MG ZS. And remind us what's uh, the power each module? Uh, each module is it's over two kilowatt hours. Okay. Um, total is forty four and a half, of which there's probably forty kilowatt hours as an official usable. Okay. But so, in the in the ZS, that's over 150 miles, and that's an SUV. Yeah. And look at this sleek, low weight number here, which is still a four seater. What is the planned amount of power and battery power range of this of this uh, EV conversion? Well, I mean, if I could equal the 150 miles of the MG, that would be pretty decent. But I'm I'm hoping that being a lot lighter and there being an awful lot less of it mm. in terms of drag um the 200 miles might be um on the cards yeah i'd um, say i'd say that's more than reasonable power wise the gen 3 leaf inverter that's 160 kilowatt versions that's 217 ps um more is theoretically available certainly arlin sansom in the US, he's extracted 300 horsepower from the early EM61 leaf motor. I originally thought that the 62 motor uh, from the leaf, which is 2013 onwards, was the only one that you could modify or you know improve the power on and then you uh, came along and uh, uh, kind of informed me that the uh, slightly earlier motor is stronger it's got bigger magnets is that, that correct that seems to be um the, the case um the motor is rated at 80 kilowatt in both both the pre-2013 and post-2013 motor that's basically what the inverter's limited to yeah but if you look at the gearing between those two versions, the early motor is revving lower and the later motor is revving higher and the gearing is slightly different, which would equate to the early motor producing more torque per amp right. and the later motor producing a little bit less torque per amp, but revving higher to get the same power. Right. And from the rumours I've heard, and um, a number of years ago at uh, Kenneth's uh, LCV, the industry event that's held at um, uh, Millbrook. Right. Um, I was eating my lunch next to the uh, Nissan guy who did some of the battery chemistry. Oh, right. That's awesome. Uh, though he'd moved on from Nissan at that point. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I understand the early motor had stronger magnets, and the later motor has cheaper magnets but they could get the same efficiency and power from the from the later motor and that EM57 um, is still the same one that's in the highest power leaf and it's going into the new Arroyo Arroyo, yeah he's using two of them that's interesting isn't it so but they're still um, using the same technology from 2013 and nine years later so it shows how you know how um, ahead of its time the leaf was really well, I mean, like, like I say, it's, it's a thermal thing. If you can keep putting more power into the motor and getting more power out, as long as you... Uh, the, the limits are, first of all, thermal. It mustn't overheat if you can get the heat out. Yeah. Uh, you've then got magnetic saturation. If you, if you create too much of a magnetic field, the, the steel just won't conduct any more magnetism. And as soon as you hit that, the efficiency drops off big time and you don't get more power out in proportion to power in you just get more heat
tight. <laughs> What's up, you? That tight turning circle is one of their few redeeming features. <laughs> Now, there's something down here which looks a bit like uh, an umbrella. That's the handbrake. Okay. Handbrake up. Right, got it, got it. Right, okay, so. Now we have two forward modes, forward and boost. Thank you. I, I have heard about boost. So we'll start. It's a bit fruity on boost. Um, this one certainly is because it's so much lighter. Let's try forward first. So is this a standard G Wiz? This is a standard G Wiz, other than having had the batteries change. Okay, and this is the DC version. No, right? this is an AC. AC. Right. Okay. So foot on the brake, into F for forwards. Forwards. Indicators are on the British side. You say British side, that's the same as my Japanese car. Yes, because they drive on the right. Ah. They, they, um... <laughs> oh my God. That's why we get so many Japanese imports. I don't feel like I'm in a car. <laughs> you're not, you're in a heavy quadricycle. That makes complete sense. And just whack on as much lock as you can, as fast as you can. So is it power assisted steering? No. Just doesn't weigh very much. It says we haven't got any battery power. Uh, don't worry about that. The okay. the energy management system is no longer in functioning order because it doesn't work with these batteries. She feels like she's got a bit of pep to her. I wouldn't want to go fast around the corner in one. Have you ever gone fast around the corner? Uh, in one? Yes, they they corner okay. You just lean a lot. Yhtiölle operaatio maksaa 300 miljoonaa Suomen markkaa. Okay, I've got. To be honest, in most of my face, I've got a charge head um, air freshener, if I'm honest. Yes, I find actually seeing out of them is not good because the pillars are big and very close to you. And you could do with being about a foot lower. Yeah. <laughs> She's got a bit of a whine on her. Who says that all electric cars are quiet? So, uh, what's the power of this? Uh... Um, are they about eight kilowatts or something? There's not a lot. No. I mean, they're faster than the Citroen Ami. I do love a Citroen Ami. They're faster than one of those. Yeah, well, oh, yeah that, I, the Ami's only like goes up to about 30 miles an hour. It's, it? it's 50 kph, 28 miles an hour. Um, I've had 55 on the clock of this. 55? Yeah, which is, is nearly. This? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think, I think I'm ready to, you know, put the pedal to the metal. Straight over. Yeah, keep going, straight line. Oh, okay. If you now go up into boost mode. Oh, okay, yeah. B. Yep. And now you find the throttle response is a little bit brisker. Oh, yeah. And there's a fair amount of regen. It's both, re both lift off and pedal. Oh, really? Okay, that's interesting. So, yeah, so you probably haven't actually used the mechanical brakes yet. Oh, wow, okay. I'm just worried if a pedestrian might pull in front of me, it might do more damage to us than... <laughs> but it has no trouble at all keeping up with urban traffic. Now it's going 30, it does sound like it's going to explode. <laughs> no, no, it'll, it'll... So it goes higher, higher pitch than that? So, oh yeah. Oh wow. Well, let's take it a bit further. Oh, oh, there's, oh there's a red light there. Oh, that, that's just saying you're pulling high current. Okay. That's like an economy meter. It's a bit like a like a like a turbo light. I used to have one of those on my diet to trade. Yeah, that's right. A, that's now, a good if one, you yeah. turn right very, very, very sharply, you should be able to pull up and park it for me. So you see that climbed the curb without too much difficulty. No, it did fine. There we go. Thank you, sir. Well, there we have it, the first experience of the G-Wiz. I must admit, it was certainly an experience. Um, I, I do fancy having another go at one of these at some point. Maybe uh, maybe around the track. <laughs> but no, it's absolutely awesome. Let me just show you the controls here. So that's the reverse, neutral, forward and boost. There's the gauges there. and uh, But yeah, the umbrella, so, that, so it turns to the anti-clockwise then. 
Facebook that... just pulls straight up, you twist oh, you it just... to release it. Right, I see. And then we're in neutral. There we go. Release. Yeah. There we go. There's an, a lovely noise come from the back here. If you can hear it. Yeah, that is the DC to DC. That's the DC to DC, right, okay. Because the even keys still in. They oh, do they? They hiss. Yeah. So could potentially uh, the hissing be uh, thermal runaway? No, thank you. Th what, you know, ending on such a high note or, or high pitched note, actually, thinking of it with the Gee Whiz there. I hate to think what it sounds like at the six, well, 50 odd miles an hour. But thank you so, so much, Paul, for uh, inviting us to, uh, you know, what a trevor trove of amazing vehicles whether it's the you know the esprit or the g whiz and the you know all the different projects you've got going on including you know pretty much one of the most famous historical ev conversions in the uk if uh, if not maybe the world oh no there are much more uh, uh famous cars well the white zombie was oh yeah the white zombie yeah and, definitely uh, definitely uh, well hopefully uh someone can write in the comments uh, who watches the video to tell me a few more famous ones that i may not know or uh, any of the uh, watches uh today um but no thank you very much and um i'm looking forward to no doubt bumping into you in a in a few meets and um uh updating you on the progress of the wedge and no doubt i will uh, uh tell you about a potential new lotus purchase in the future perhaps but no thanks again paul and it was great to meet you good man thank you